Anyway, so it begins the legend of Miss. Yeah, 20 years ago, right? Um, I feel old because... Um, you feel old. I know. Well, you gotta yeah. understand. I mean, I know. Anybody have gray hair out there? <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Yes. Um, I take it all of you have played Mist, right? Or at least, I mean, come on. I don't have to tell you what it is. Um, let it, yeah, okay. Yeah, you find a book, that book. You, like, have to use that book to go to different ages. And, yeah, whatever. Different worlds known as ages. Um, so, yeah, I'm Maria Harvey from Tale of Tales. I'll be your host. And this is the man himself, Rand Miller of Cyan Worlds. And now we're going to try and take you by the hand and explore what it took to make this game and how its legacy can be of interest to indies working today, all right? So I remember, I'll just start with my little story real quick, that I remember playing Myst, like I guess in 94 or something, I don't remember how old I was and I'm not gonna say, but I remember playing it in the dark, like I would, it was sort of like my, I don't know, first introduction to what um, games were in a way. I wasn't a gamer, I, yeah, I'd played some arcade games, but this was the first time I would be like at home, come home, wrap myself in a blanket, kind of sitting at my desk, you know, and play this game. And it was just so influential. Um, I, I, it sort of made me all think, gosh, you know, I could, this is such an artistic, like, uh, experience. It made me feel like um, so much more was possible with video games than um, the arcade games that I had seen before. And I found that really, really inspirational. Um, I'm not even sure I thought of it as a game, though. Um, which is something that, you know, uh, people who know me and know Tale of Tales, it's something that we deal with a lot in our work, um, the notion of what is a game and what isn't. So I'm hoping we'll get to all of these ideas um, in our conversation. We're, just to also start out, I'm showing a little slide here of yeah. your, I don't know, tool, uh, the paintbrush uh, that you use, yeah. HyperCard. Our evolution. Yeah. To a certain extent. And these are screenshots, I guess, from they're all from uh, Cosmic Osmo, or is that one? Yeah, one from, from Manhole. Manhole, and Manhole and also, from yeah. Osmo, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's just showing that, I mean, these were drawn worlds, I get that I guess were drawn by your yeah. brother. Right. right. Yeah, and these were also uh, children's games, right? Yeah. Were, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Children of all ages. Children of all ages, yeah. It's yeah. a nice little. But when you made Mist, you decided it would be definitely a game for adults. Um, we did. Could you talk about that decision a bit? I mean, were you just sick of children's aesthetics? Or, <laughs> I mean, yeah. No, you know, I, like any, um, I don't know, like any development effort, you kind of fall into. You, it, it, it's got a mind of its own. It kind of evolves itself. And so we got into the, to building worlds. I think we've said this a numer numerous times, but we got into building worlds because. Hypercard came out, which is the upper left up there, and it seemed like, oh, this is great. We could build, we could make an interactive storybook, mm -hmm. and that was what I contacted my brother about. I'll make it short because I've said it before. Mm -hmm. um, he never got off the first page of the interactive book. He drew a, a fire hydrant and a, and a manhole, mm -hmm. and then opened the manhole, and a vine grew up. And who cares what what the next yeah. page was? I want to go down the manhole, and I want to go to the fire hydrant. And I want to climb up the vine, and so it became this this world. Yeah. Um, and so. It evolved. I mean, the world's got a little more sophisticated um, <laughs> as we went from Manhole to Osmo, and the stories got more sophisticated, and the, we started to tie things together rather than just have a certain randomness. That if you play yeah. the Manhole, you realize it's random, and then that kind of led to a desire to say. I mean, it kind of led us. We were perfecting our craft enough where we thought, well, we can do something for an adult, you know, lowercase uh, a yeah. adult audience. Um, yeah, and that's where Mist came from. Okay, because you went from that aesthetic to this, where you're truly trying to create a, 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 something that resembles the real world. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, why you know, did you go from a drawn aesthetic into 3D? You know, originally we were going to draw it. Yeah. We were going to draw Mist from hand, uh, by hand. Robin was going to paint every image. and. It was just timing. It was knowing your tools, knowing what your constraints are, knowing the technology and working within those limitations. And it just so happened that the timing was right that our limitations kind of opened up a bit. Yeah, and we 3D wasn't all that common yet. I mean, right, at all. right. Um, but we found a 3D 3D software on the on the Mac. We were using Macs at the called? time, Strata, oh, Strata Vision. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we did some test scenes. Robin and I both loved it. And mm -hmm. so we made the decision, oh, let's let's do it. 3D rendered, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, as luck would have it, it worked out great for us. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing about um, Mist Island 
I mean, I have a little the map of yeah. Mist Island there. Um, I mean, it's such an interesting space and place to be in, and it's almost like every screen was like a little postcard and from this imaginary place, you know. And and it was, it, but it felt like not like a slideshow, but like full motion video. I mean, so in some ways, it was like the world was in your head. Yes. And yes, I and I found that effect a lot like reading a book at the time. Like it was really strange. It was more book like than movie like, but at the same time, I really felt like I was there and immersed. That's a great. Point. I mean, we felt that we found out that uh, people's minds filled in all the blanks. We talked to people, you know, years after playing, and they were like, "Oh, I love the clouds on Mist Island." It's like, well, there were none. Um, so, uh, we love them too, but that was in your mind. Yeah. Uh, but it's exactly what you're saying. But I think that's sort of the magic of 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 like a lower tech. Uh, gaming experience. I don't know, and it's something I still really appreciate, actually. Yeah. Um, but the aesthetic of this world, I mean, it's like, it's kind of blocky, but it looks, it, and it didn't look realistic, and you had the hand had already, the hand. Yeah. you know, and yeah. that's something that, um, yeah, maybe you didn't invent it, but it just really felt like you were there touching things. In and the world, and we, and we didn't want much more than that. It was, we were, we were making stuff up as we went along. I mean, I'd like to say that, you know, we were geniuses in what we did, but the timing was right. We had evolved to the right stage. Mm -hmm. The CD-ROM was coming out, 3D software. So a lot of stuff fell into place for us, but but we also didn't have, we, we were really indie at the time. We didn't yeah. have a publisher who was telling us what to do. And we said, well, you know, what if you don't die? And, you know, what if we don't put anything else on the screen, just the cursor for the most part. You yeah. just get your information from the cursor and there's no menus really. It's just, just you and the screen. And so. We were pushing things only because we could. It was just the two of us designing. Yeah, two brothers, and you yeah. make a game and story about two brothers. No coincidence, coincidences there. <laughs> well, you know, it, it it's handy when your actors are the two guys making the game. Yeah. And you don't have to but I mean, that's really go. indie. I mean, you put yourself in your own game. You yeah. Know? I think that's that's yeah. really really great. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> indie is is a uh, is very nice way to say it. Yeah, you could yeah, see, yeah. The, you know, the basement where we filmed it. It was. Uh, it was uh, beyond in. <laughs> <laughs> and so your design process that was like a real back and forth between you and your brother. Right? Yeah. It's like yeah. I, I remember you saying like that he would draw something and then you would figure out um, what what to do in that part of the world yeah. or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was Could very. You it, it was back and forth okay. between the two of us, but it was also uh, iterative on the on the on the paper. We it was just a big blank piece of paper, and we didn't. I mean, we didn't know how to do this. So mm -hmm. we thought of it as an architectural project. So we started with a map and it, I remember Robin drawing the dock. It's like, well, we knew it was an island because an island could constrain mm -hmm. where, you, where you would go. And we didn't want there to be places that it looked like you could go that you couldn't go. We had played some games previously that had alleys. It's like, well, I should go down that alley. Oh, I can't go down that alley. Well, why not? Okay. So an island was a great way to constrain that. Um, so the dock, drew a square of the dock and then we started some steps up and the interesting thing was as we were drawing the map essentially um, we began to draw buildings and that made us think of stories which made us think of puzzles and it was this kind of this uh, uh, tripod that mm -hmm. that reinforced each other I mean what you draw a little more and it makes you think of a puzzle, which makes you think of a story, which lets you draw a little more. And it really fed on, yeah. each leg fed on the other. Very and, organic. And, yeah, until the island kind of started fleshing itself out. Yeah. yeah. So what were the division of tasks between you all? Uh, it was actually, we're, uh, we're a great team to work together. Like like we had been on the children's stuff. Um, I'm, the, I'm the programmer guy, mm -hmm. um, if you could call hypercard programming, um, oh, yeah. so easy. I just love that uh, environment. But um, yeah, I grew up being the geeky computer guy and Robin was more artistic doing the, yeah. the art and the music, but he knew enough about programming that he could call my bluff when I said, oh, we can't do that. And he'd mm -hmm. say, oh, yes, you can. And I knew enough <laughs> about art to call his bluff when I said, this shadow's wrong. And he'd go, yes, no, it's not. And I'd go, yes, it is. And so we we really challenged each other and it was, it was good. You know, we pushed each other. Um, in the right ways because yeah. of our skill set. And HyperCard at the time, if you guys didn't know it, it was based on like card stacks where you um, could, what was it? You, you would have a screen yeah. and you would just assign interactivity, but it was like very, 
so know, intuitive. Almost real time in a way. Yeah. I mean, oh, you're yeah, yeah, telling yeah. me that, that you were testing it and changing things on the fly. Absolutely. With the early games, even with Manhole, Mist also, but with mm -hmm. Manhole, Robin would send a picture, we would link it, and we could start walking through the world. The world yeah. would grow as we added an image in real time. And same thing with Mist. I'd get an image from Robin, put it in, connect buttons, and boom, the world was yeah. bigger. One, one image bigger. So it was sort of a serendipitous uh, time where this software allowed you to make something, something, you know? Absolutely. Were, were you much more into programming? Like, could you have programmed, like, from scratch? Or, I mean, what, why the choice of HarperCard? Because it's what we knew. Mm -hmm. And I think any design project, I mean, particularly from an indie point of view, which I keep coming back to because it just, that's what we did, was, is about knowing your limitations. It's mm -hmm. about figuring out the box you're in and doing everything you can within that box. I mean, yeah. It feels nice to think that you, could, you, know, you don't have a box and you don't have limitations, but if you try and design with that without limitations, you're not really yeah. gonna get anything. Yeah. And that, those limitations helped us really tune things to that, to, to, to what we were using. And so we, we did things, I mean, the, the, the industry itself was moving toward real time, oh. but in our, um, with Doom and, you know, yeah, there's, yeah. there's get into the whole in a minute, end right? of things, but we, we liked, where we had come from and we felt like we could do good things within those limitations. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting that you call MIST an architectural uh, project because I found this picture online. Is that, is that, does that still exist? It does. This it is does. The, the entryway to Cyan, to Cyan World's yeah. HQ. I mean, and it looks, right. I mean, I'm sorry, but come on. Yeah, wow. that's the house that missed. I mean, it's the, right? yeah. it's the aesthetic of Strata vision or something brought into like real life. I yeah. just thought that was crazy. So no, I had to was, stick it in. It was in. fun. That was probably the most, the most fun thing about the building was kind of extruding that brick wall from the from I just the thought entryway. this was hilarious. It's, yeah. it's really cool that you guys, uh, I don't know. It's almost like you had such a commitment to the world that you wanted to make it like in real life. Oh, we had a lot of money then too. Charming. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I mean, I, I wish I had that money back for that thing. Oh. <laughs> I could do a few indie products like that. How many games could you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So yeah, okay, just a few meta ideas that I that occurred to me. It's like you have this sort of connection. The top two screenshots are from the games, but then the bottom are are things that fans have made. Yeah. I mean, there's you have had made like quite an interesting like fan community that doesn't die. I mean, it's like yeah. this game just keeps going on and being re reinvented or re discovered yeah. in a sense. Yeah. And I don't know, but I I also loved that in the in the in the game, I guess because of all the references to books and me feeling like I was reading a book while I was playing. I mean, what's up with that? Why why books? Why um, this connection between? I guess what it really what really resonated for me actually was this um, old technology brought into a new technology, yeah. and that was really compelling at the time. I feel it was but, great. I, I mean, I'd like to once again. We were artistic geniuses, and we knew from the beginning we were going to use books because of the wonderful <laughs> metaphor and oh, blah blah. blah. Yeah. But but when we first designed, I, I, me, and a lot of this you see, we we originally thought, well, there'd be these images of of these guys and images of you know that we would of places that we would go, and you know we'll just put them on a monitor, or a TV thing, or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then at some point, as it started to evolve and mature. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we realized that, that was kind of trivial and ridiculous, and we were trying to think of a of a wonderful portal, and it was books. And as soon as we said it, it was like, of course, of course. Yeah. And but it maintained some of that, uh, retained some of that uh, static yeah. kind of video production from from what the original. Yeah. concept was as well. And it actually made me think of, of Shakespeare at the time too, like Cristo, Cristo, and, you know, yeah. and all that. So it was sort of that, yeah. I liked all these connections that were yeah. possible to make. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, great magical connection. The bottom right book in that image is amazing. That, yeah. We have that in the vault at at Cyan, and yeah. it's crazy. And is that some, a fan? That a fan, that? yeah. It's actually Australia. made a book with the, the video in it, and, you know. And it's actually got all the games in it, and I think it's got the, the text of the novels in it, and oh uh, so, and if you touch it, you link. Um, that's why we <laughs> keep it in the vault. It's yeah, because it's dangerous. Yeah. I mean, at the time, there was other technological things that happened. I mean, there was the invention of QuickTime or the introduction of QuickTime. So you have, you were one of the first games to have these little 
FMV uh, full motion, well, full motion. I mean, yeah, you postage have stamp postage videos. Stamps, yeah, videos. I mean, what was the sort of idea with that? I mean, um, we weren't sure when we started the game. We weren't sure how we were going to do video. We knew we had some backup plans, and I think that's a, always a good thing to do. Well, you know, we can have some things up there that'll move. We're just not sure if we can have. Yeah. Nice video and QuickTime came out. It was like great. That will substitute for our backup plan. And we know that we needed small postage stamp size plugs, and those elevator windows got small enough so that you were, you know. Yeah, but it really made me feel out, like. But, I mean, in those moments, like, wow, I'm actually in the elevator. I'm moving. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. so it was like strategically placed. And, and once again, it's designing with your limitations. Yeah. Instead of looking at it as a limitation, you just well, the design's going to have to fit this. We have this much video, so yeah, we can make that work. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else I got here. Oh yeah. These are the wow. Yeah, the the legacy, the whole lineage of the game. That's why I have gray hair. And, <laughs> yeah, you have Mist and Riven, which was, I guess, definitely you guys alone, or Riven, right. slightly bigger team because yeah, big, you know, much bigger team. Yeah, because it was money. Yeah, that's exactly. That's how this always works. I mean, you you made Mist, and it just blew up basically, yeah. and oh, you yeah, sold we so what like six million copies of this yeah. game. I mean, yeah. Uh, which is crazy, and which is crazy. but we're, you weren't expecting that. I no, bet. no, no. I remember the conversation. Robin probably said this in his talk, but I remember the conversation saying, "Man, we could just sell a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand would be awesome. That would be great." Yeah. And it was. It just went crazy, much to our surprise. Yeah. Um, but then after that, you got Miss Exile, and like that's that was. A publisher deal or what? Like that what happened after Riven? Product that was never going to happen mm -hmm. um, because we said, "Oh, we're done." Riven was all, and uh, and uh, my brother went on to to you know exploring movies and linear medium, and I went on to Mist Online, thinking, mm -hmm. "Well, I don't want this to end. I'm, I want to build a bigger world that's more alive." Yeah. And we said, "We don't really need a sequel." That Riven told the story, but. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there. Uh, the opportunity arose, mm -hmm. and uh, no, I see. when the and the uh, and actually the whole design was put in front of us, and we said, "This pretty good. nice. It's not bad at all." And you know, I'll use that money to go toward Mist Online, and mm -hmm. so yeah. We yeah, because it sort of went yeah. like, all right, just sort of thinking how this went. I mean, Mist was pre-rendered always, I guess. And then right. you've got Riven that was also pre-rendered. Right. But then in, you, in, but Mist was made by different developers. And then you go into Uru and suddenly it's real time with an avatar. Right. I think that's weird. Right. <laughs> like that's, suddenly, suddenly you have an avatar. Yeah, like, exactly. What, I mean, we can talk more about Uru later. I have like a better, more in-depth moment. But um, was was Mist Five End of Ages? Was that also real time then? There's a long story here that involves <laughs> a lot of nastiness and oh, no. publishers and yeah. evil and uh, oh, no, I'm sure you don't want to hear it. Oh, uh, no. I want to hear the the well, nice little I mean, developer complaining about a publisher. You probably don't hear that very much. So uh, <laughs> anyway, it was it was doing what we could at the time. Honestly, we're a small shop, and it, we're, it's kind of rare these days. But we've mm -hmm. managed to to stay alive, yeah. um, up and down, and we've managed to keep almost everybody who's worked for us, you know, still in touch and, yeah. and like us. You know, so we 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 care about the employees. We, you know, the population of employees goes up and down. Mist Five was something that kind of kept us alive after a, a very, you know, someday we'll do a post mortem on it, but mm -hmm. a, a, a very traumatic experience with the with Mist Online. Oh, right, right, um, right, right, right. And it allowed us to use resources and stay alive and that yeah. that to us was important. Well, I think the interesting thing about the Mist itself or the first two games, Mist and Riven, is that they I mean, I found online this list that said it's on 3DO, Amiga OS, CDI, iOS, Jaguar, CD, Mac OS, Nintendo DS, PlayStation, PSP, Saturn, Sega Saturn, Windows, Windows Mobile. I mean, the, it just I find that really fascinating because um, part of the problem with making technological art games, um, it, games in general, is that the technology decays really quickly yes. and from generation to generation. And yet you're, you're sort of, by taking it from one platform to the next, to the next, to the next, it sort of keeps 
the game alive. And in a way, I think that's really, I mean, I really think that's important because it sort of keeps the, the history alive. There's so many games that can't be played now. Right. And it's kind of cool that Myst still can be, in, even in, in its original form or as real Myst, you right. know, and, or, you know, but what, what's, why do you keep porting it to? <laughs> you, you know, some of those ports are shoehorned and some of them are really good. You know, yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, the iOS port is really good. The iOS one was close to our hearts, and that's why we did that. It, that it's funny you mentioned the cursor. Yeah. I mean, the cursor was a hand, and so when, when there's this great platform that's touch interface, you know, yeah. and it feels like you're taking a layer of abstraction out when the hand, the hand cursor becomes your hand. Yeah. Um, and your finger actually touches and moves, so it felt like a very, a really natural thing. And yeah. once again, that that was a came at a great time for us to kind of employ people, build things up a little bit. Um, and we view the mobile platform has lent itself well. Some of those uh, were definitely shoehorned, and um, if you bought any of them and didn't like them, I had nothing to do with them. Uh, it was some other person, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, who, and even to be honest with you, we were surprised with the early, um, some of the early consoles that that Mist was ported to because we really had designed it with a mouse in in mind. It was mm -hmm. it was tactile and you touched it and you moved, and so playing it with the with the controller wasn't always the best experience. You know, it, it, it depending on how it was implemented was better or worse, but. Um, yeah, we, it was easier for us to, to take on some of those, the ones that we felt closer to, than, and let other people do the, 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 uh, the platform translation yeah, in sense. other cases. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. everybody wanted it, you know, yeah. of course it's a big hit, and it's like, well, we don't put mist on... Everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, just to, these slides are kind of other games, but just to set up... What, this is something that I, I've been thought about a lot. I mean, at that time in the 90s, I guess between like 1993 and like 1997, there was no internet, obviously. I mean, there was an internet for only part of that. But in the beginning, 1993, when Miss came out, no internet, no web, you know. And so uh, there were all these games that were not games <laughs> as such, but they were sort of like dreams for adults, in my opinion. And there were a lot of them. I mean, there's this one, The Dark Eye, which is actually an interpretation of Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, I'm just wondering if you were, like, in the scene that was around at that time, like, what were you into? Um, we weren't gamers. Well, I was, I was more of a gamer than Rob, and he definitely wasn't a gamer. But, but we were influenced by stuff even earlier. When we were doing Mist, we lost t touch with everything because we were so <laughs> intent on doing it. We mm -hmm. kind of didn't have our finger on the pulse. But earlier, we had played Zork and... There's some of those early text games. I think there was one, uh, boy, I don't remember. You you started in a stall of a bathroom. That's all I remember. Yeah. You kind of had to explore your way out. Um, anybody remember the name of that one? What was it? No, 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 no. no. This so. is like no. before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is. Yeah, I'm looking for the gray hair guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Know, so, yeah, <laughs> this is way back. But and then there were other ones that were that led up to what we were doing. That we always, you know, as we were. Building Mist, it was funny because it was it was uh, initially funded by a Japanese company we have a partnership with, uh, Sunsoft, mm -hmm. and they were things like the Seventh Guest were coming out. I don't know if anybody knows that, mm -hmm. and there was an interesting project in Japan called the L Zone, and some real experimental stuff where people were building worlds to explore. And they kept asking us, "Now, is it going to be as good as this? Is it going to be as good as this? Is this going to be as good as this?" Right, right. And Hell Cab. I mean, there's all these people experimenting with, with stuff, and we were like, "Oh yeah." Yeah, it's gonna be bad. Yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> and we'd be like, "What? What is that? Yeah. What are they talking about?" And we'd look a little bit, and we'd think, "Oh yeah, I think we're, I think we're yeah. as good as that. I think we're doing okay." Yeah. So we were influenced, but in a way that um, that wasn't damaging. And what I mean by that is, you, you can react to what other people are doing, mm -hmm. and it, it's good to put that through a, a filter of your own, so it has your own feel to it. Yeah. Your your own. Uh, you don't let the the judges tell you what to do when you when you've got a voice and you kind of feeling pretty strongly about it, but you still want to listen to them. Yeah. You just don't want to automatically take what they say. I think the, the interesting thing for me about this time in, in video game history is that all these games were so different from each other. I mean, there was a t this this whole diversity of games, and they were the, what you say games for adults in a way. I mean, they yeah. were, and and they. Um, 
sort of didn't necessarily have to have combat. I mean, there, you didn't invent inter adventure games, you popularized right. it, but at the same time, it was like um, this interesting diversity, diverse way that people were playing the different stories, different experiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially a game like Cosmology of Kyoto or The Last Express, where it's just, you know, you're yeah. playing the story and oh, it's yeah. really. Well, you Beautiful. felt like you you felt like it wasn't a game. Right. It was it was a world. It was a place. It felt like yeah. you were doing something different than what traditionally gaming had been. The friction was different, and the the story was there was something richer there and deeper there. You were pulling a little more out of it, and and we hesitated to call what we were doing a game. We kept referring to it as a world. We're building a world because mm -hmm. we wanted it to feel like you were going to a real place, and I, all those things kind of felt along that same line, like people were experimenting with that idea of yeah. building and, a place. And I think that what happened after Mist, you have games like Zork Nemesis and and Obsidian and to a lesser extent Eve, um, which was made by Real World Games, where it's like, you know, all of a sudden it became the thing to make these Mist clones. Um, I wouldn't call it even Mist clone, but it's but they were still these playful worlds. I mean, Zork Nemesis had a very strong, like, misty feel to it. But then you get into Obsidian, and it was just absurd. And, like, you know, but it still was the same pre-rendered point and click. You know, it became, I mean, I, I imagine an alternate history of video games where the sort of spirit of all of these things, where it was about playful environments that didn't, I mean, yeah, there may be or may not be puzzles. Like in the case of Eve, it's not exactly puzzles. It's more like you're just clicking around and things are happening. It sort of yeah. reminds, uh, well, someone was mentioning earlier your first game, Cosmic Osmo, yeah. like had a lot of that, where right. it's just a really playful environment and you you discover the game within yeah. it, you know. Um, but, I mean, the Mist clones, I mean, after a while it became a bit of a plague. I mean, <laughs> of like every game had to sort of be a little bit like Mist, you know, or a lot like Mist. Right. And I mean, how did, how did you feel like suddenly to be the, you know, to a, I don't know, influence things to such an extent that you're making, that people are making clones of your game. Yeah, we were kind of excited. I mean, it, yeah. to be honest with you, it was, we thought that things would kind of fork at that point with entertainment and there'd yeah. be a whole fork of this exploration or adventure or world games or whatever you want to call yeah. them, these things that, that drove you forward with curiosity of what was around the next corner. Mm -hmm. what, and. Uh, and we thought there would be some really good ones that publishers would fund. There'd be big money in this, and be some stuff we'd be excited to play. And there were some some decent things coming out, but it felt like it just kind of dribbled off after that. Yeah. And I think we had we had both um, raised the bar for that kind of exploration game, and 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 I don't know whether it was raised enough where people got scared or publishers yeah. got scared. It seems like publishers. Do things that are more of a sure thing, and they still weren't sure about yeah. what this thing was about. You know, how they couldn't measure the number of units they would sell. They only knew Miss did a bunch, and uh, so they and kept it, trying. The marketing departments, you know, tried a few things, and they didn't maybe didn't sell well, so it just kind of dribbled yeah. off. But but you mentioned that you played Doom at the time also, and that yeah. you really dug that. Did, yeah, did was, you think that for cool. the world also? Yeah, I mean that that whole idea of real time. I'd been, you know, I. Um, those of you who are really old gray hairs, Battlezone was an arcade game that was, you know, vector graphics, green, just green lines. Yeah. But I remember the feeling of being, whoa, I'm in a tank in a world. My brain filling in all the all the blanks for me. But that idea of real time was always exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and so Doom and all the ones that were, you know, people who were starting to push that technology on kind of a uh, parallel track. I was looking at that technology thinking, well, man, real-time 3D is eventually, it's, it's, yeah. you can make more real worlds. They will feel more real. Yeah. Um, I mean, it feel, feels to me a bit like like Doom kind of won, like for a long time, yeah. where it was like, oh, games are these, like, you know, sort of solidifying or gelling like what a game, video game is, like, and taking it away from it being like, oh, a game can be this very playful thing. Because I think, I mean, in the sense of, of, of it not having a strict, um, predictable kind of gameplay um, and more about exploration of a world. Um, right, instead of the, think, instead of the think, achievement, yeah. Doom kind of pushed it more toward achievement. It's like yeah. you gotta kill something, you gotta level up, you've gotta yeah, destroy a certain number to get a score, and that, that's traditional kind of gameplay mechanism, yeah. but it it definitely pushed it that, that direction instead of the other way. Yeah, I kind of feel like when the web came along, it sort of took some of that, the, the, the CD-ROM aspect, the exploration aspect. I know from my, in my case, 
when I first saw the internet, I was like, oh, I can make mist with this, you know, <laughs> <laughs> which is a silly thing to say, but it was, I really felt that. And right. then I started getting into like VRML and like weird yeah. things because I felt like it had to be this like, I don't know, it, it was just a really the first thing I thought of. I mean, so how did you feel about the web when you saw it? Well, like, yeah, I mean, after the web, I looked at after mist as, well, this makes this allows me to deliver content so that the exploration never ends. I can just make the world bigger. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't stop. And and that was kind of what drove us after Riven to to start the Mist Online yeah, stuff. It's these are like, screenshots from Mist Online. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it, the idea yeah. was instead of a massively multiplayer game, which you know, of course it was called, but it was instead of playing with thousands of your closest friends, you could define how big the group the group size was. The internet didn't say you had to run across strangers, it just said I could play with my friend from across the country in a very intimate setting if I wanted to, and we liked that, um, or by yourself, frankly. But, but what we really thought was interesting was the broadband element that allowed the game to grow, and the, it allowed the story to be told, and it allowed you to put actors and, and uh, storylines in real time in, in the game. So that, I mean, the, the whole point was that every time you came back, something new would happen. If you came back every night, something new was there. If you came back every week, something even bigger every every month, mm -hmm. which I think would coincide with your monthly payment, there was <laughs> something much larger. Um, and I, I still think that's a great idea. That's what people are used to when they watch TV. They want something new every night and they want, you know. So you guys were actively actively things. adding things to the world, and, or was it just unlocking things as you went every time? You oh, it was both. We yeah. had oh my goodness. Well, this this could go off into a long okay. haul. But basically, <laughs> we, we, had, we had set up a lot of stuff to mm -hmm. to kind of build this as a studio. So Mist Online would would have a lot of stuff in the pipeline that would be added to the mix, and we right. had we had a lot of stuff. We had a year's worth of content ready when Mist Online was ready to go live to, mm -hmm. to roll out, including ages and actors and storylines and lots yeah, of things yeah, yeah. that would be played out and just kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. macheted at that point, yeah. so. That's sad. But, okay, so last bit of questions and then I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Um, all right, so this is a screenshot from one of the later Mist <sighs> games, yeah. Um, but, I mean, yeah, okay, now you can make games with millions of poly polygons, you can have VR. I don't know if you've tried the Oculus. Uh, yeah, Rift. oh yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, are you interested in this new tech at all? Like, do sure. you, does this still yeah. give you like lots of ideas? It's, it's an interesting balance because the new technology, Mist, in some ways we stumbled into something with Mist that was really intriguing, is, and that was accessibility. Anybody could play Mist, mm -hmm. and I, that was one of the reasons it did well. We didn't, we didn't necessarily think that was going to be the thing, but frankly, you put somebody in front of a mouse with a cursor like this with a picture yeah, on the screen, yeah. and They're they just really click. Stuff. You don't have to really tell them what to do, and the more technology or the more buttons you give people and the more controllers you give them, the more complicated it gets, and the more you kind of limit your audience and have yeah, yeah. more of a, and I'll call it a niche, but it's it's a pretty big niche still, but it, it still is not the mass market that maybe Miss was able to appeal to. So. That said, every time you add another element like Oculus Rift or real-time 3D, mm -hmm. you 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 have a little more complexity that you do have a growing base who knows how to use, yeah. but you're also limiting a few more people on on the edges. Yeah. If you were making this today, would you make it more of an audiovisual experience, or would you put the puzzles in still? Or would, would there be more with the new buzz? I mean, you know, you, what would you do now? Yeah, we've learned from both Mist and Riven, um, and Mist Online as well. Um, and I'd like to think we were geniuses at this point, but still, for some reason, we just haven't gotten there. I don't, I don't get how this works. You'd think with gray hair, I'd be a genius could just crank this stuff out. But um, we learned from Miss that the puzzles were both uh, too hard and too easy. So we made, so with Riven, we made them harder and easier, and it wasn't, you know, it didn't, it, it was too hard then and too easy then. So we thought we had all these great formulas um, from Mist that we could improve yeah. Riven with, and I don't know that there's a formula. It's a it's yeah. a fluid thing to develop things, and you watch as people play this thing, as they explore, you watch what they do, and they do things you don't expect, and it's a, it's a, it's really amazing to watch people in your world, yeah. I and mean, that's, that's what we learn from, yeah. you know, that's, that's what we do. Again, I, you know, I just, I just, uh, we just had, uh, Real Mist on Oculus Rift and we were wandering around in there. It's a really cool feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and then you go throw up in the bathroom and then you come yeah. back and play some more. 
Um, but it's it is I mean it's it feels like you're there um, in in some really amazing ways that I don't know if it's if it's palpable and sellable but it's you know it's yeah. another level that that's intriguing. Oh, that's cool. Well, okay, new projects? Anything coming up? What are you guys doing? Yeah, we've been you know it's we we've been keeping ourselves alive, mm -hmm. which is unusual for you know an independent developer, and we've had. We've had a lot of people employed, and we've had a few people employed, but we've managed to kind of stay alive, sometimes barely. Um, but the mobile market has helped us kind of at least get a foothold by converting that stuff. And you know, I, I like to think it was it was a natural thing for us, and it, it worked. But we you know, we're, we've got some some bigger ideas. Some of them we've had for a while that we'd love to do, and publishers were kind of like, "Yeah, we want something new and different." And we show them, and they go. Yeah, no, not, not like that. that. No, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. not it. Well, I mean, you could self-publish it. We could, and the, and the interesting thing now is, frankly, we've gotten we've gotten gotten used to being in control of things. The yeah. whole App Store model and Steam yeah. is so refreshing. And you know what? We're not rich, and we're not making tons of money, and lots of that old money's gone. But just having kind of control and yeah. and ha owning your destiny and being able to do what you want is it's very satisfying, you know. When when, I, when there was a company of fifty people, it, it feels like you lose a little control and you lose touch. And you, I don't, you know, when people would come into work and I'm like, wait, who are you? I don't even know who you are. And that's weird. I, I like people and I like the employees we work with. And it just, you know, things got weird. And smaller groups, um, with maintaining some form of control, is is a good thing. So Kickstarter to me is. An oh, awesome in opportunity, well. and so yeah, we're I, we're putting together oh. something for a larger cool. project on Kickstarter. Cool, right? So that's the interesting. I mean, I'm I for one, I'm happy that you that you went to the mobile market also, just because I could go, wow, they have missed <laughs> from my iPad. That's, that's cool. how I feel. Like if people yeah. have missed. How do you play that now? Before I was like. I, I don't know. It doesn't work on anything anymore. Now I can yeah, pull yeah, out my no. phone. Right. Keep it alive as long as you can. I mean, I think it's important just because people will hear like mist. What's that? Oh, yeah. I can go and play this game. So I don't know. Thank you um, for this conversation. Um, that's the end of the formal part of it. I hope you guys have questions because now it's your turn.